Hello, everyone. Welcome to MaxMin 2024. We continue. We will talk by Professor Daniel Rigdon from our University of Liverpool. He will talk about using deep learning predictions. Using deep learning predictions reveals many register errors in PDB deposits. Over to you, Dan. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> Yes, right. So, um, yeah, well, thank, first, thanks for the invitation. This is a, an interesting and unusual meeting, so it's it's always fun to come and talk to different kinds of people. Um, so this is my acknowledgements out of the way first, in case I forget later on. I'm, I'm talking about this, but most of the work was done by Philo. Adam here did a lot in the final stages, and also Greg and Ronan's participation there at these institutions and with these funders. So, hang on. And I, I should probably say, I mean, I'm not in charge here, but it, it might be one of those talks where it's useful for people and to interrupt if they haven't quite understood right. some. Yeah, so feel free to interrupt as we're going along. Um, going to be in three parts, really. So the introduction, I'll talk a little bit about how protein structures are currently validated. So validation is just trying trying to verify that there's no mistakes in them. Uh, I'll talk a bit about evolutionary covariance, explain what that is. It's probably not a phrase that's familiar to you, how you can use that to predict residues, amino acids that are touching and how far apart they might be in structures. That leads to our new validation method, which is published, and I'll talk you through the um, key features of that. And then the most recent work, which has just been accepted, is where we went to the PDB as a whole, and we took all of the structures in this range, three to five angstroms, both X-ray and cryo, and we tried to validate them with our new method, essentially. So we kind of called it PDB wide, but we focused on this resolution range because we thought better than three, maybe it's quite rare to make mistakes i'm not sure that's true but that's what we thought at the time and we thought worse than five people are not going to be attempting full refinement into the maps because the maps are not good enough so we thought this would be the kind of sweet spot to detect mistakes uh you, you'll see examples of register errors but essentially they are simply areas where um, the main chain has been put in the right place, but you've docked in the wrong part of the protein into that chunk of the map. So you may have assigned residues 1 to 10 to a particular region of the map, but in fact, that region of the map corresponds to residues 3 to 12, whatever. So th it's just uh, the wrong sequence has been docked into a region of the map. And that's the kind of error that we're particularly good at detecting with this new method. And then I'll just talk through the results about how many structures contain these errors. We can see some interesting trends over time. We compared our set of predicted errors. And these are only predicted errors, of course. We're not saying these are all cast iron errors. Um, we compared our set of predictions against other uh, validation methods, um, which have different strengths and weaknesses. And then a little bit at the end about some limitations, and that actually comes back interestingly to, among other things, fold switching proteins, which is the same class of things as chameleon sequences. Uh, they are an issue for us. So just a bit about how proteins are currently validated. I mean, obviously, validation is extremely important. We have the PDB full of all of these beautiful structures which get used for all sorts of downstream things. But if you've got a mistake in your structure and you spend a lot of time screening against a site that contains a mistake for drugs or running some molecular dynamics, then that's essentially wasted time. It's wasted energy. It's more CO2 in the atmosphere based on a structure that has a defect. So it's really important to validate these structures, to have confidence in them before we take them to these downstream applications. Of course, everyone's aware of this. The PDB itself has many uh, validation tools, which it will give you scores for. Um, so here, th these are some of the things that have come up in previous talks and in conversations. Here are clash scores. So these are atoms that are too close to each other. Ramachandran outliers, we'll come back to those actually. Side chain outliers, so side chains that are in unusual conformations. 
<laughs> and this this acronym here is referring to whether a residue fits well in its density. And so you get these sliders, which can be blue if everything's looking fine, or red if everything's looking bad. And you get your percentile markers here um, for all structures and for structures at a similar resolution, because, of course, the likelihood of having any of these problems goes up if your map is not very good quality and therefore is harder to interpret. And you get this kind of analysis, these color codings of particular regions that may or may not be problematic. That's at the PDB, but at earlier stages, of course, you're in a molecular graphics environment. You're trying to determine the structure and you have lots of validation options um, to try and stop you making mistakes, to correct mistakes before you even get to the PDB. The key point I want to make here is that the current validation, both post deposition and pre is very largely based on geometry and stereochemistry these things we understand well and whether the map fits the model and so you're dependent really for a whole lot of these important methods on whether there's a map and the quality of that map so if the map is not very good these map model scores are not going to be very reliable because everything is just too ambiguous so this is what current validation is largely based on. That's one issue. So we would like, I should just say, just to finish off, if you've got a map that's not kind of poor quality, it's actually very easy to produce a tracing into that map, which is perfect geometrically, perfect stereochemically, fits the map kind of, because the map is not very good, but is actually completely wrong. So it, it's these are by no means sufficient we need other validation methods. So that's one issue. And then another issue that's come up recently is when people have, it's kind of trying to game the system a little bit. If you know that your structure is going to be tested against a bunch of validation metrics, you sort of take care about those metrics. You consider those metrics. I'm using metrics loosely here, apologies. You, from, from the beginning, um, and you may be persuaded to uh, adjust your structure to get rid of perceived issues in ways that are not justifiable. That's a very wordy way of putting it. It'll become clearer here. So here again is hopefully a correctly labeled uh, dihedral angles. We've talked about Ramachandran plot before. Here's a Ramachandran plot showing um, that the blue, the generally favored areas for phi and psi, and then Glycine especially has its own uh, pattern, as does proline. That's all perfectly well understood. So this is kind of what you might expect to see as you're going along, or even in a final structure which has a not very good map. But these, these points here are outliers. They're probably mistakes. You would try and go and fix them. But if you look at a Ramachandran map for an old PDB deposit, you'll find plenty of these outliers labeled. It doesn't mean there's anything dramatically wrong. These are just little local errors uh, in the backbone. But of course, people now have said, OK, I need to, my final structure should have a beautiful Ramachandran plot. How can I get there with a beautiful end result? Well, I can in include in the refinement some restraints which push residues into what I think are the correct bits of the Ramachandran plot. And so people have revisited the whole statistics around the Ramachandran plot relatively recently. And here is an example of a structure that's a large number here, positive or negative, doesn't matter, means a kind of unusual distribution. So you've got the same kind of blue background distribution here, but the red points are not really following, well, they're clearly not following what you'd expect to see. So we've got whole areas that are very favorable blue, but everything is tucked too tightly into the middle of this distribution. And we've got this weird region here. So clearly what's happened here is that as this structure was being refined, inappropriate or excessive restraints were being put in place. So the final Ramachandran plot, wow, there's no outliers at all. And it's 94% in these core regions. These look great, but actually you've squashed them in there artificially. And by doing that, you've no doubt introduced lots of other errors in, in the model in this kind of obsessive drive to produce a beautiful Ramachandran plot. 
So now this just as exemplifies the fact that there's a bit of an arms race. Any kind of validation method you come across, there's a temptation to introduce that into the refinement. But if you do that, it immediately loses its value as a validation tool, uh, as we're seeing here. So those are two reasons why we sort of continue to need new validation measure, um, methods. Right. Complete switch of track here. I'm going to explain the kind of data that lie behind our new validation method. And I need to explain something that's perhaps not very familiar. So this idea of evolutionary covariance, um, this has been a big deal in bioinformatics for a decade or so. Um, this is how it arises by evolution. So imagine here's your protein. Imagine there's this really important contact between two amino acids, these red spheres here. Now, as evolution, as, you know, as your genome is irradiated, mutations occur. And if this, uh, imagine this contact here is really crucial for the folding of the protein and therefore for some really important function in your body. So it may be that you get a mutation here. That mutation alone you might never see because that destroys this contact, destroys the function of the protein. However, if you got a mutation here and simultaneously mutated the second position, maybe the combination of those two would compensate. One would compensate the other and they would retain this contact and therefore retain the function of the protein. So we may not see single mutations, but we may with time see where a pair of mutation, a pair of residues which are close together and required to maintain a contact have mutated essentially simultaneously or at least in a way that's coordinated over the long term. So what that means is that as time goes by, if we look across a bunch of different sequences of this protein, this might be human, monkey, mouse, whatever, we can start to see that these two positions, the amino acids we see at one position, kind of correlate with the ones that we see at another. And that's because they're close together in 3D space and are required to maintain this contact for the protein function. So that's how this covariance between these two positions arises. The, the use of this, in, this observation, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec, for predictive purposes comes when we can generate this sequence alignment. Here we've got a bunch of sequences, we've aligned them, they all line up. And then we, we can say, okay, we expect we will look within this sequence alignment for pairs of residues, pairs of positions that have some kind of statistical correlation between them. And if we see some pairs, we can infer that they're likely to be close together in 3D space because that's the most obvious reason why they would be co-varying in some kind of coordinated way. And the reason this was super exciting was if you spot enough of these pairs, you can imagine these are kind of elastic bands on pairs of residues within a long string of protein, and you can use them to fold them up. So you might end up with a structure that was completely new, and the only basis for the predicting that structure would be the information in this sequence alignment. Does that kind of make, make sense? So just a little bit more on this. So the procedure, um, you start off with your sequence, you search the databases, you find homologs, so related sequences, you line them all up, and then you're spotting columns. This pair of blue residues appear to co-vary, so do the, the red ones. Um, and we can infer um, that those two residues are close together within a single molecule, or we can do the same analysis by pairing up sequences across a bunch of different species and looking for a position in one protein that co-varies with a position in another protein. And that might be because they're close together at the interface between those two proteins. Dan, Dan could, yeah. could I ask if uh, by sequence between, say, two red letters, uh, is the sequence should be the same or almost the same in all aligned <clears throat> sequences? It doesn't need to be exactly the same. It just needs to be some statistical correlation between. 
but, but the same length. Right? Well, they need to align. Well, mm -hmm. no, they don't actually. Some of these positions could be gapped, but you would say the residues that I'm seeing at a particular position correlate with the residues that I'm seeing at another position. This is based on over, overall uh, alignment. Yeah, yeah, they, these are aligned. You're not seeing any gaps here, but there will be gaps elsewhere in, in this alignment. And what, what the typical lens of these um, subsequences of them? No, no, everything. Protein. Mm -hmm. I see. So it could be anything. So not yeah. necessarily short. No, no, no. Okay. no. So, um, so people have actually tried to do this for a long time but the first statistical method that really worked well was called deep coupling analysis it's worth saying you do need a large msa msa stands for multiple sequence alignment so you need a large set of sequences that you can align and then soon after people had done the basic statistics people are applying machine learning and deep learning to the results and improving them incrementally and this was a huge area of research in bioinformatics for about a decade mm -hmm. uh, and there's huge numbers of applications i mean we're talking about using it for validation but the main one was for predicting structures so just to introduce what the results of this look like you you look at all of these you pick out a bunch of pairs that you think are touching and what you end up with is what's called a contact map where here we've got a relatively short protein and in gray is this right in gray we've got the actual contacts that are uh, seen in the structure and we're comparing those to two different predictive methods which are predicting the contacts so you, you for years we saw lots of these contact maps and we you can use both diagonals for different things you can compare predicted contacts and actual contacts and see how well the prediction works and so on and so on and because these are kind of two-dimensional there's a lot of emphasis on things like convolutional neural networks to spot patterns you can see these diagonals here these diagonals are beta strands and you can if you think about it anti-parallel and parallel beta strands will be different diagonals and so on there's a whole world of literature around this but basically people are predicting contacts and using methods to improve modeling of proteins especially proteins which didn't have a a similar structure in the PDB. So that's called ab initio modeling. Dan, could, could I ask the meaning of color in, in this particular uh, sequence? I don't actually remember. I don't think that's important, actually. I think these are different parts, di different secondary structures in the protein from the look of it, or different Same. regions of content. So different groups. Uh, so it's not a distance. Um... Not yet. Mm -hmm. I'll come I, on to that. I, okay. So, yeah, I mean, contact here, they defined as the C betas being within eight angstroms. That, that was a kind of... C betas, not C alpha. No. So, of course, glycine doesn't have a C beta. They just use the C alpha for glycine. But it, what worked best was C beta within eight angstrom. Yes. So, because sorry. it's more central. To... Yeah, because, because it, if, if a contact is... If there's evolutionary pressure on a contact, it's between the side chains, right? You're not going to see because main chains, a mutation wouldn't affect the main chains. The main the mutation will affect the side chains. Mm -hmm. So what you're detecting are nearby side chains which have some statistical connection to each other. Okay. So you want a, an, an an atom that reflects the side chains, not the main chains. Mm -hmm. And and CBT is present in all other yes. Just, glycine. just only glycine doesn't have it. So these are contact maps. This is a kind of binary: are these residues within eight tankstroms of each other or not? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll come back to distograms in a second. But just to uh, sort of flesh that out a little bit, what was what made this really possible and exciting for for modelling was was two things. One is getting the right kind of statistics. So people had done this for ages with different kinds of statistics. This direct information or direct coupling, you can see it produces a, a more representative set of predicted contacts than this other alternative method. But also the vast number of sequences which were being accumulated over these years. So here you've got examples just illustrating known structures 
and how well you could model them with the right kind of statistics versus the wrong kind. And you can see from the RMSDs, you do a much better job with the direct information method. But over here, it's interesting. You've got the blue it is showing the RMSD of the error on a model that you made using information from a particular year. And what's changed in those years is the number of res uh, sequences. So you've suddenly got the ability to generate um, huge multiple sequence alignments, and they are much more information rich. So what you get out are better quality contact predictions, and you can generate better quality models. Yeah. Um, so at this stage, it was binary contact maps. Very quickly, people realized with deep learning, especially they could predict distance distribution. So this is a distogram that represents what is the most likely distance between two residues. Again, we've got the residues here and here. So you're looking at X, Y to see what's the predicted distance, the most likely distance between X and Y. And you can see you've got a lot more information here than you did here, allowing for much more sophisticated modeling. Is this distance matrix symmetric? Uh, yes. Yes. It's symmetric, yeah. Yeah, because the distance from one to the other is the same. X to Y is the same yeah, as Y to uh, X, yeah. The image looks a little bit non-symmetric, so that's why I'm asking. Does it? Here. Okay. So it means they ran over the data. No, you're right. That's not symmetric. I don't know what that's. The pixels look quite theoretically, so the theoretically symmetric. It's impressive. possible that the, the these, I, I, I can't remember where I nicked this figure from, but it is possible that they were comparing two different variations of how to predict the distances. You've obviously got the two triangles to play with and you can they can be symmetric or they can show different things so so this is essentially the state of the art alpha fold one 2020 big excitement at the time this was two steps you use the msa here you use these deep neural networks you predict the distogram that's the output number one and then a separate step they converted that into models by two different methods which worked more or less equally well. Nowadays, of course, AlphaFold 2, it's end to end. So it's one single step from sequence through to model, but you can still get out these distograms and we do, and that's what we've used in, in the results that I'm gonna show you. Right, so uh, this is us putting, this is our method that uses the predicted contacts, predicted distances to validate a structure. So there are two elements to it at this point. Um, we only took one forward to the latest uh, research. But at this point, we did two things. We said, OK, we'll train a, a support vector machine. We tried other architectures. This was fine. And basically, we're looking at the compatibility, the agreement between an actual structure which can be anything, something from the PDB or something you're working on. And we say, how does that compare with the distogram or with those predicted contacts? So this is sort of more granular information. This is more fine grained. We have this from AlphaFold2. We can convert the distogram into a contact map because that's important for this method down here. But we look at various measures of the agreement between the two we select them in the usual way and we use a classifier to give us a residue score that says this residue is fine or this residue in its structure doesn't match the predicted contacts and distances that we see for that residue in the bioinformatics result. Uh, we had as a training set um, some results from this EM modeling challenge, ELM is electron microscopy. So this is another mode of structure determination. They had some competitions over a few years where they challenged automatic methods to trace a structure into a map. They actually had a gold standard final version 
of a structure so we can we know when a mistake was made and so we had some pretty authentic mistakes um, by comparing um, some of the results of these challenges some of the results some of the submissions so this is one of those exercises like CASP where groups are testing themselves testing their methods against a challenge sometimes they work well sometimes they fail um, make errors not fail um, so we had a set of errors authentic errors that we could train against uh, and then the second method was uh, a program self-contained program called contact map overlay so this just works with this low resolution contact map information you basically put your contact map that you've calculated from a structure and the one that you've predicted from uh, the bioinformatics, you put one on top of another and you say, okay, I expect these agree quite well, but are there reg regions where I can shift the register of a, the protein in a way that makes the contact maps superimpose better, aligns them better? And so this again is what I mean by a register error. So here is the register in the model. Here's a chunk of sequence that's been docked to a particular piece of the map. And this, this method here is saying, if you align, if you realign these contact maps in such a way that this chunk of sequence goes forward for residues, that predicted contact map aligns better with the actual contact map. Does that kind of make sense? Yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, so, right, yeah, so Upshot, we have one method which is general in its ability to detect errors. So this is measuring inconsistencies of any kind. And this one is specific because it's looking for register errors by realigning chunks uh, of, of the contact map. Um, like any sort of newly developed method, we realized it could go astray in various situations. So we put in place three different filters that we realized would help eliminate a lot of false positives. So um, in this case, um, the AlphaFold2 model in the region that we suspected an error was very poor quality. So this, as you know, is a measure of the confidence in the AlphaFold model, which is here in Cyan. This region is not confident. So we say, okay, if the model is not confident. We, you know, it appears that the information is not very good in this region. Therefore, it would be unwise to predict a register error in this region. So we say, okay, we've kind of detected something a little bit anomalous, but this might be a false positive. So we'll filter that out. The uh, same here. Uh, if the model and if the AlphaFold2 model and the structure we were looking at were very different and couldn't be aligned in the region we were interested in, we said that's a likely false positive. And then here, um, this, this is actually a small protein. I think it's on a ribosome. And this protein, if you think about it, our method requires that the protein that you're validating has contacts and distances within itself. In other words, it has a kind of folded up kind of structure. This protein is just a kind of long sausage. And so it doesn't have enough many predicted contacts between, you know, a residue here and a residue here, for example. We don't have a lot of information because of the shape of this protein. It's not folding to make the contacts that we can detect. So this is another kind of common source of false positives that we eliminated. Um, we use the, the sort of general method and the contact map overlay. They generally agreed. This is pretty good agreement. They didn't detect relatively small number of methods, so their sensitivity is quite good. But each of them detected a few unique um, errors as well. And the numbers in brackets, so the, these, what we were looking at were mainly register errors. You can see the main values here, which are much larger, are register errors. The brackets were other kinds of mistakes of some kind, which, of course, this method doesn't detect. This one does. Um, 
and then just to visualize it so this this is now available I mean, in ccp4 it's all distributed and you get this kind of nice graph so this, the svm results are in this cyan here and in this bar here um so the orange is saying these residues in this range here which is smoothed a little bit they have high scores which is bad that means they're inconsistent with their predictions it looks as if there's something going wrong here and we've got another peak up here and then the bottom bar here is where that second method the contact map overlay has, has produced a result here so in this particular protein it appears we have a register error here and possibly another kind of error here I'm not sure about that that's only just over the threshold um, so the register error here, when you look at it in the map and when you correct it, and this is a kind of key, um, mm. I'll go back, but our method tells you how to correct it. So if you correct it in the way that's suggested, you go from this, which is the deposited structure where certain side chains are not very happy, sticking out of the map, it goes to this where these side chains look much happier and, and looking at these aromatic side chains is how we did a lot of sort of eyeballing and sort of verifying that indeed um, these do appear to be errors which we can correct and improve the fit to the map um, so our just to be absolutely clear here our method is not map dependent but sometimes of course we have a map and we can look at the map and sort of get a feel for ourselves whether it truly is an error that we've managed to correct the other thing to note here actually is this was 2.5 angstrom so that idea that below three angstroms everything would be fine is clearly not true there, there may be quite a few mistakes that we need to go back and detect at higher resolution daniel uh, yes a couple of questions blue t junction uh, which is taken out of um new or updated structure oh the, sorry this here yeah well yeah i mean that's that doesn't look super happy but overall you've improved things and you can you can demonstrate that in statistics and as well as visually so you, you will measure um, some distance um, some accuracy of fit yeah yeah so you, you can measure a correlation coefficient between the the coordinates and the map in the vicinity of those coordinates and on average you can see that the fit is now much better mm -hmm. even though there are some bits there will always be some bits that are sticking out of the map mm -hmm. so just summarizing um the method at that time um, we had these false positive um, filters the key point really i think is that our method is map independent so it doesn't matter if it's a crystal structure, cryostructure, NMR structures don't have maps. We haven't done much with them, but it doesn't matter. All you need are the coordinates. And of course, that means that it doesn't matter on resolution either. Um, we feel it's particularly powerful detecting register errors. And like I say, instead of just saying you've got a problem here, it tells you you've got a problem here. And I think the best fix for it is by shifting these residues, plus three, minus 10 residues. You know whatever it is so it tells you how to fix it as well so Daniel, if, if you shift for example by four residues then what happens with, with that gap of four residues yeah yeah well uh, yes uh, that yeah i mean that's not the end of the story that's saying this region you need to fix shift like this but then there'll be a knock-on effect at the loop at the end of that region and a knock-on effect mm -hmm. at the loop at the beginning you will need to re uh remodel Re retrace those so there will be a new se sequence one it's the same sequence you, you just put all allocating the sequence differently to a different part an alternative part of the map it's the same sequence uh -huh. so the sequence remains the same yeah but uh geometric embedding of that sequence the fold the folding yeah 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 so the sequence here is exactly the same the map is exactly the same you're just assigning this blob of density to the tyrosine instead of saying it belongs to this glutamate or whatever it was mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so keeping on time I tend to ramble
Right. Um, so yeah, the, the results most recently, we've gone back and looked across the PDB. Um, so these are the numbers. Uh, as was said before, there's obviously a lot of redundancy in the PDB, so we cluster on sequences and so on. Uh, ultimately, we find almost 5,000 unique predicted register errors. If you ask how many of these entries that we looked at were affected, it's about one in six. But because these mistakes or predictor mistakes are very small, it's only a relatively small percent percentage of residues that are predicted to be misregistered. But I don't know, some people I say one in six structures had a mistake and they say, oh, well, that you know, blasé like this. I think one in six, that's loads. So, um, yeah, perceptions differ, but I think that's a lot of structures with pretty clear mistakes. Um, so we can ask um, in that set when they were deposited, what their resolution is. So this is not a surprise. If you look at the resolution from three to five angstroms, at the worst resolution, you get a greater percentage of depositions that have a predicted error, whereas at three angstroms, it's only about 10%. Um, what's a bit more of a surprise is if you look with time, that things oscillate a bit, but actually recently the, the number, the percentage of depositions that have a predicted register is increasing, which is not what you want to see. Um, why might that have happened? Well, there's obviously a trend from crystallography, which is on average higher resolution towards cryo-EM, which is on average a bit lower. Um, Cryo-EM targets also often much larger, so you've got just a lot bigger map and many more opportunities to make mistakes. But also we can, I mean, and this goes back to what John was talking about in the morning, sometimes people will you know, not pay enough care and make mistakes because they're rushing to publish in some high-impact journal. Yeah. Uh, if you compare Cryo-EM uh, to crystallography. Indeed, you see a greater incidence of these errors in the cryo-EM structure. But if you look at the errors and say, um, how big are they in terms of numbers of residues? Most of them are very small. There's not that many that are large. Um, and as a percentage of the deposited residues, this is very low. Uh, and mainly the, the shifts i.e. The, the correction that's required to get it in the right register is quite small, which is probably what you'd expect. It's easier to be out by one or two than it is to be out by 10. So um, we wanted to compare our predicted errors against what we would see by alternative validation tools, um, essentially to have more confidence that what we're thinking of predicted errors are genuinely errors. And we thought of various approaches. So what we did was look uh, to see if there were higher resolution structures of the same protein or a very close homologue, possibly been deposited later. And our expectation was that if there was a mistake in a 3.5 angstrom structure from 1995, when you come along with a 1.8 angstrom map in 2010, you probably correct that mistake. And so we'd expect the later high resolution structures not to have the same errors as the early ones did. We also tried to improve, well, we tried to look at the refinement statistics, you know, the R factor and so on, um, by correcting those errors. And because of the number of errors, we could only do that in a very simplistic way, but that did actually work. And then we compared our results against a map-based method called Check My Sequence, which is specifically designed to detect register errors. We compared, we looked at Ramachandran outliers in these predicted error regions, and we compared it against a score that's specifically a deep learning-based score for cryo-EM maps. Um, but just to make clear what our expectation was, because our method is completely new and uses a different kind of data, we were expecting that we would detect errors that other methods didn't. And 
uh, vice versa, we'd expect other methods to be able to have strengths that ours didn't. So we would expect kind of partial agreement. It, it does not invalidate our method that it doesn't find everything that other methods do, of course. All of these methods have strengths and weaknesses. So, um, so this is the first idea. We went and looked for higher resolution or rather high resolution structures um, and saw whether there were errors in them. Again, our expectation was that in a high resolution counterpart structure, there wouldn't be an error because the better resolution would have allowed them to correct it. And that's generally the case. That's the blue dots here. But we did have a few interesting red dots where we still saw the error even in high resolution structures. So we looked at those a little bit. And this was interesting. So we've been talking about chameleon sequences. We've been talking about, I'll talk about forward switching later on. This is what I called structurally ambivalent. You could probably call it forward switch as well. But genuinely in each of these very high resolution structures, there's a, dis a difference in the register of a region between um, the two proteins. So that's why we still see a so-called error in the high resolution structure. Um, there's another high resolution structure where we don't see an error and that's because it's a region that's generally has two possibilities. Um, this one is a bit less clear. Um, so we had a relatively high resolution structure um, which did flag with an error but it was near a gap and the density in the region was very bad. And there was a different uh, structure, slightly worse, but still high resolution that had the same register as we predicted with the bioinformatics. So it looks like there's a mistake in that 1.6 angstrom structure because locally, it's not 1.6 angstrom, locally, the map is much less good. And then this one was a bit weird. Um, um, we didn't have maps to look at. Uh, it was a bit less clear, but it may be no coincidence that this protein has disulfides and alpha fold where we're getting the predicted distances, predicted contacts. Don't forget, alpha fold may have an issue with the disulfide. So that's perhaps contributing to the, the confusion there. But generally speaking, our approach was validated by the lack of errors in high resolution structures. And then the basic idea of trying to correct the errors, um, we could do that in a simplistic way because there are large numbers here. So it had to be an automated way. So it's no surprise that some cases worsen. Cases that are better above the diagonal when it's 80% for each set, you may say, well, you've made it worse in some cases, but that's because the way that we were automatically trying to correct the register error was necessarily quite crude and programmatic and you know it will never work in all cases. So I think this is absolutely fine. Um, this was comparing it against a map-based method, check my sequence. In the end, um, we could only compare performance on a smallish number because check my sequence will only detect 10 residues or bigger register errors and many of ours, as I showed you, much smaller than that. But we did see there was complementarity between the two methods. So um, some of some errors were detected by both, but many errors were detected only by one or the other. Um, our method here did, extends to much worse resolution because, of course, check my sequence is a map-based method. And so as soon as you lose the resolution in the map, you lose the performance. But we're independent of map, so we're less, well, we're independent of resolution. So then another question we asked was uh, in the vein of could these errors have been picked up with more conventional mm. ideas? So here we're looking at stereochemical and geometrical outliers. So Ramachandran plot outliers, you'll know what they are, side, side chain rotomer outliers. So side chains that are sitting in conformations that are not commonly observed in C beta deviations. Um, the message from all of these is the same, which is that, yes, our predicted errors contain more of these problems, but mainly our predicted errors contain very few of these. So there's no way that you could have used any of these signals to detect our errors. Mainly, there are very small numbers of Ramachandran outliers in our errors, 
even though the distribution says that there's a few more than in other bits of protein. So they're overrepresented. These issues are overrepresented in our errors, but the signal is not strong enough that you could use these issues to unambiguously detect the errors and forget about our method. And then finally, um, comparing against this DAQ score, this is a, a way that's specific for cryo-EM maps where they use deep learning methods to predict where C alphas are, what kind of residues are in different positions. And then they say, okay, um, the structure, the coordinates that you put in the map, they either agree with our deep learning predictions or they don't. And they give a positive score where everything looks fine, a negative score where it seems to be a problem. What I've got on the y-axis here is um, the change, the improvement in correlation coefficient when we corrected the errors. So all you need to really think is anything above zero here. We improved the statistics when we corrected the errors, so we're pretty confident that everything above zero is genuinely an error because it improved when we corrected for it. Uh, and this just shows you that over here, we've got errors which we detected and which the DAC score detected. But there's an awful lot of errors over here, which we're very confident about, but which the DAC score says this is absolutely fine. So again, there's complementarity here, and we're detecting errors that they aren't. And then again, we looked at examples where we had maps just to sort of visually, you know, sanity check that... Um, when we corrected for the error, we were making improvements. We're picking out again these aromatic residues because they're kind of characteristic in showing us that um, they're, they're sort of big, chunky things that need to have a blob of density attached. So here is a tyrosine that was unhappy, no density. We correct for it. It's now got its density. And these correlation coefficients that measure the map, uh, model map uh, agreement improve. And then exactly the same with some crystallography examples over a range of resolutions, some of them found by map methods, some of them not found by map methods, just found by our method. And then finally, um, some limitations. Uh, so fold switching proteins. <laughs> so what are these? These are proteins where a chunk at least, a substantial chunk of the structure adopts a very, has two different, but each biologically authentic and real confirmations. Um, so these are proteins that, that are happy, that, that exist in two confirmations. So of course, we're always going to struggle with that because our method is going is going to lean towards one confirmation or another. Our method is saying, does this structure agree with this set of predicted contacts? So if that structure does agree with the predicted contacts for one of those confirmations, by definition, there'll be a disagreement in the other confirmation, the fold switch version, which we will incorrectly flag as uh, an error. And this was one that Adam dug out of the, the data set where I think we've got two chains here and they are in one that one's kind of normal in quotes. The other one is fold switch. The region in question is the one that's got the color within. So uh, and it's in a different confirmation in the two chains. This is the original map. Um, where there's sufficient density, even though it's not brilliant, to, to support it. And then this region was flagged as an error by our method. And when we try and correct it, we get something that looks like this, which is not, not as good. Um, I can't remember the full story, to be honest. Perhaps Adam does, but maybe not after all this time. But essentially, it's no surprise that our method falls over with fold switching proteins because our method is designed to assess the compatibility of one structure with one set of bioinformatics predictions. Another uh, limitation, of course, is that we're still, even in alpha fold times, we're still dependent on MSA depth. So we need our protein to have lots of similar proteins in the database so we can line them up, make an alignment, and extract 
the distance and contact predictions. So this is usually the case. It's not usually a problem, but if you're working with some very unusual protein that's a, a singleton, there's one you know, obscure creature somewhere that has this protein and nothing else, then our method is not going to work. And then it's not really a limitation, but just an observation that, of course, these days people are using these deep learning methods and alpha four predictions uh, throughout structure determination. So in an extreme case, for example, you may take an alpha fold model, stick it into a low resolution map, and that would be your final structure. Uh, you may think that's useful. You may think that's not, not useful. But the point here is that if you've use this kind of information, the deep learning methods, the distance predictions at an earlier stage, and you haven't done meaningful refinement, mm -hmm. then you can't bring that same information back later on to validate your structure because you've already baked in the information that it's not independent anymore for validation. Yeah. So yeah, it's just some conclusions really. So one in six of those structures had an error. Our method is complementary to existing methods. We've shown that quite extensively, I think. We don't need a map. We don't need a high resolution map, independent of geometry. It really is orthogonal to everything that goes before. Uh, and we're now working to extend it. There's a new postdoc coming to work on extending it to validating nucleic acid and protein, 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 nucleic acid interactions in exactly the same way. And that's, that's really it. There's the QR thing if you want to go and read more. Thank, Thank you, you, Daniel. Okay, uh, I'll stop recording.